In section 9.5, we're going to take a look at alternating series. Now, in the previous couple of sections, all of our series have had terms which were all positive. So what we're going to do now is take an alternating series. Now, the word alternating means we're going to go back and forth between positive and negative terms in our series. So let's take a couple of series here. Um, negative 1 half to the nth power summed up from 1 to infinity. And negative 2 to the n plus 1th power summed up from 1 to infinity. And we're going to write the first few terms of these series. Negative 1 half to the nth power if you plug in 1, and again, we are starting at 1 here. So if you plug in 1, you get negative 1 half. If you plug in 2, well, the 1 half will be squared. That'll give you a fourth. But the negative will also be squared. So that'll give you a positive 1 fourth. If I plug in 3, well, the 1 half will be cubed. The negative will also be cubed. Um, hopefully everybody understands what I mean by negative cubed. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1. So negative 1 cubed will be a negative 1, and we're going to get negative 1 eighth as the third term. The fourth term, again, raising something to the fourth power, this negative symbol raised to the fourth power, or negative 1 raised to the fourth power is a positive. So you get 1 16th minus 1 over 32. And you can see as we add and subtract, each subsequent term is going to go from negative to a positive to a negative to a positive to a negative, and so on and so forth. So we're going to jump back and forth between negative and positive numbers. Therefore, this thing here, this series here, is an alternating series. Now, the other series that we dealt with, um, some, or that we dealt with, that was on that PowerPoint slide was negative 2 to the n plus 1 summed up from 1 to infinity. Now, in this case, when you plug in negative 1, your exponent becomes 2. So you get negative 2 squared, which is 4. When you plug in a 2, your exponent becomes a 3. And therefore, negative 2 to the third is a negative 8. When you plug in the number 3, you get exponent, which is 4. So you get negative 2 to the fourth, which is a positive 16. And you keep going like that to the fifth is negative 32. When you go to the fifth term, you're plugging in a 6 as your exponent. That's a positive 64. Oops, minus 128, plus 256, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So here's the first few terms. Now, I do want to point out something in comparison to the first infinite series that we dealt with. Notice that this one starts with a negative and then goes positive and then negative, positive, et cetera, et cetera. This one starts with a positive number and then goes negative. But both of these are alternating because we're going back and forth between positive and negative numbers. Okay? It doesn't matter if you if your first term starts out as a negative or your first term starts out as a positive, as long as you go back and forth. And you'll notice that in each of these cases, the interesting uh, the thing that made the alternating was this negative sign being raised to a power of n, or in this case, the negative sign being raised to the power of n plus 1. And that's what actually determines what an alternating series is. So you can rewrite the series, the two series that we did, with a negative 1 to the nth power times 
some terms which are all positive. Everybody, hopefully that makes sense. Or, in this case, we wrote negative 1 to the n plus 1th power times a bunch of terms which are positive. Sorry, there's a little bit of a mess up there. That n plus 1 power, excuse me. So, here's uh, what we're going to do. Negative 1 times some, again, exponent, which is either n or n plus 1. That, that n versus n plus 1 essentially tells me whether I start as a positive or whether I start with a negative number. And then times a bunch of positive parts. So it's pretty straightforward that basically when we have an alternating series, the alternating series can always be written as a series, n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the nth times a positive part, or n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1 times a positive part. And if we can rewrite the series like this, and by the way, obviously you don't have to start at 1 every time. If you started at 9 or if you started at 0, that is fine as well. Um, I chose to start at 1 on both my summations, but you can start at any um, non-negative integer you'd like. So if we have an alternating series, it turns out that there's a really nice test whoops, to determine whether this alternating series converges or whether this alternating series diverges. And the test is simple. These little extra positive parts, all we have to do is say, well, does the limit of these positive parts go to zero? And do they decrease? This is decreasing. Now, you might say, well, how can a positive uh, term go to zero, have a limit equal zero, and not decrease? Um, decrease or stay the same. And it turns out there are some weird ways. Essentially, that's not going to, you're never going to see that in this um, class. You're never going to see this um, second condition be a real factor. So all we really have to do is say, do the positive parts go to zero? And by positive parts, I mean once we factor out the negative 1 to the n or the negative 1 to the n plus 1, do those parts go to zero? And specifically, do they decrease towards zero? So that's it. That's the alternating series test. If they decrease towards zero, then the alternating series converges. And we know if they don't go to zero, then the alternating series is going to diverge. And so that's it. That's the alternating series test. Now, don't use this with just positive terms. Remember, we just came out of a 9, 2, 9, 3, 9, 4, where we've seen when it's not an alternating series, but when our terms are always positive, then going to zero is not sufficient to converge. So this alternating series test only works for alternating series. Do not try to apply it for series with positive terms. But let's take a look at, it, uh, at an example here and determine whether or not the following series converges. We have infinite sum of negative 1 to the nth power times 1 over n. So we take a look at this. We've already have this negative 1 to the nth power factored out. So all we need to do is ask ourselves, um, does the limit of the positive part of that term, the always positive part of the term, go to 0? Specifically, does it decrease towards 0? Let's put it up there. All right. Limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n. Sure enough, as that denominator gets bigger and bigger and bigger, as that denominator goes to infinity, this whole fraction is going to go towards 0. And it's always going to be decreasing towards 0. So by the alternating series test, why is this not? All right. 
So by the alternating series test, the series converges. Okay, so that's a again a really nice um, tool to have for alternating series. When we have an alternating series, we just need to take that underlying positive part and see that it goes to zero. I want you to push pause and try this one. Determine if this alternating series actually converges or if it does not converge based on the alternating series test that we just saw. Go ahead and push pause on the video. Take a few seconds, or, and I'll pause it. All right, so here we go. So we take this alternating series here. Now, it doesn't matter that this starts at 2. By the way, it has to start at 2, else you're dividing by 0. But basically, you're looking at this fraction here, and hopefully you see that after you factor out the negative 1 to the n plus 1, that's going to leave you with 1 over the natural log of n that you're dealing with. Now, as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the natural log gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So 1 over natural log of n is eventually going to go to 0. All right, it's going to be 1 over infinity, which gets you to 0. Now, it's going to 0 very, very slow, but it's still going towards 0. And so that's all we need. It's decreasing towards 0. So by the alternating series test, the series must converge. All right. So by the alternating series test, the series converges, or at least that series converges. Maybe I'll just write this, that series converges. And that's it. That's the alternating series test. Let's do a couple more. Maybe I'll give you these both at the same time. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to do the next two examples on your own. Example number three is negative 1 to the n plus 1 over n factorial. And then example number 4 is negative 1 to the n times n plus 1 over n. Both these start at 2, but that really doesn't have anything to do with anything. So example 3 and example 4. Try to see if the alternating series test tells you if these converge or diverge. Push pause and I'll be back in five seconds. All right, so negative one uh, to the n plus one over n factorial and negative one times n plus one divided by n. So let's take a look at these two problems. I'll start with a negative 1 to the n plus 1 power over n factorial. If I factor out that negative 1 to the n plus 1, I get a positive component of the term, which is 1 over n factorial. The limit as the n goes to infinity is obviously 0. N factorial grows at a very, very fast rate, as we've seen. So 1 over n factorial gets really, really, uh, gets to be a fraction with a really, really big denominator. And therefore, going towards 0. The whole fraction is going towards 0. So therefore, since this limit, we have underlying sequence, the positive part of the underlying sequence is going towards 0. The alternating series test says, that the series has to converge, all right? Hopefully that makes sense. The series itself, this thing, is what's converging. All right. Now the next one, we take the sum, negative 1 to the n power times n plus 1 divided by n. So when you factor out, this negative 1 to the n power, you just are left with n plus 1 over n. 
If you look at those terms, well, as the n goes to infinity, the limit of this rational function is 1. We know that by either L'Hopital's rule or comparing coefficients. By the way, 1 is not 0, and therefore, by the alternating series test, this thing has to diverge. All right? So when I say this thing diverges, I'm not saying that the underlying sequence diverges, this part. I'm saying that the infinite series, the sum, is diverging. Okay? And there we go. So that is a really, really nice tool for the alternating series test. All we need to figure out is that limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence decreases to 0. So the sequence, underlying sequence, has positive components, which are decreasing towards 0. If we know that, then the alternating series test says the series converges. Otherwise, whoops, otherwise, this series diverges. Okay. So we have a really, really nice test when we have alternating series. Again, do not use this test unless you have alternating series going on. So when we have alternating series, we have a really, really nice test. The other part of alternating series that's really nice is that we get really, really good approximations by using alternating series. So, again, like I said, one benefit of the alternating series is that it has a pretty easy test. Do the terms of the underlying sequence go decrease to zero? The other big benefit is the benefit of approximating easily. So let's do this via example, and I'll sort of lay it out for you. So we're going to look at this alternating series, negative 1 to the n plus 1 power divided by n squared, summed up starting at n equals 1 and ending at infinity. So I'm going to write out the first um, few terms. Maybe I'll write out the first, I don't know, eight terms of this series. All right, so there they are. I've actually wrote out the first 10 terms. Now, you can see that when you, whenever you plug in um, a positive integer, you plug in that positive integer, the square of the positive integer is the denominator. And then depending on whether that integer is even or odd, if it's an odd integer, you're getting a positive 1 as the numerator. If it's an even integer, then you're going to get a negative 1 as the numerator. And I've just, um, instead of writing plus a negative 1 fourth, I've just wrote neg minus 1 fourth. Um, again, sim similar, instead of doing a plus a negative 1 16th, I've just wrote minus 1 16th. So we're alternating back and forth. Each time I have a um, odd integer that I've plugged in, you get a positive 1 over that integer squared. Every time I have an even integer that I've plugged in, I get a negative 1 over that integer squared. So 1 over 1 minus a fourth plus a ninth minus 6 sixteenth plus a 1 25th minus a 1 36th plus 1 over 49 minus 1 over 64 plus 1 over 81 minus 1 over 100 and so on and so forth. Now, here's the real nice thing. I'm not even going to go all the way back to my full screen. I'm just going to say this. How would we approximate this sum 
to be within 1 over 25 of the actual summation. So we want to approximate this sum, and we want that sum to be very, very close. I want to know that I am within 1 25th of the actual sum. So here's what we do. We say, well, the first time that I see a fraction, which is 1 25th or less, is right here. So notice that there were four terms whose fractional component is bigger than 1 25th. So what I do is I take, oops, and I break up my sum into two parts. Let me just go and even these four, first four terms and then the rest. Now we've seen these first four terms before. The sum of the first four terms, that's the partial sum on the first four terms. If I look at that, S4, I'm just going to do that on my calculator. So 1 over 1 minus a fourth plus a ninth minus a sixteenth. And when I convert that to a fraction, I get 115 over 144. Again, that's what my calculator gave me out. Hopefully I didn't make any mistakes when I typed that in. All right. That's essentially this piece here. Okay. So I can highlight that. Now, the remainder, I claim, is going to be less than 1 25th. And here's how I know that. So first off, we're going to call this something. We're going to denote this. We're going to call this remainder you get after four terms. Hopefully, everybody understands what I'm saying there. So let's highlight this green. That green is what we're going to call the remainder after four terms. We'll call that R4. And what I'm claiming is that I know the remainder has to be positive, but it also has to be less than it couldn't be equal, but I'll put less than or equal to, I guess. doesn't matter if you put less than or less than or equal to. Um, and it has to be smaller than 1 25th. Now, let me explain why that remainder has to be smaller than, has to be positive, but also smaller than 1 25th. So let me copy it. And just take a look at that remainder. Again, this is R4. This is what we're calling R4. I'm going to unhighlight this. Oh, I didn't unhighlight it. I apologize. There we go. And you know what I'm going to do right now? I'm going to take this out of brackets because I don't need that brackets. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pair these things up, all right? And I'm going to pair these things up in two different ways. One way is going to show that zero, uh, that the remainder has to be positive. And the other way is going to show 
that the remainder has to be less than 1 25th. All right, so let's take the first case, the positive. In the positive case, what we're going to do is we're going to pair up, whoops, terms like this. We're going to pair up pairs of terms. And they're going to be 1 25th minus 1 36th plus 1 49th over minus 1 64th, and so on and so forth. Now, you can see that because we're an alternating series and because we converge, so we're an alternating series that converges, these terms are decreasing. Therefore, each pair is going to be positive. So R4 is going to be a positive number plus another positive number plus another positive number plus another positive number, and you're going to keep going and doing that forever and ever and ever. So if you look at it that way, R4 has to be positive, has to be bigger than zero. Now, you can look at this another way as well, in that you can pair up terms. Let's leave 1 25th alone. And then do pairs of every other term. This should be, let me try to make this a little bit clear. Pass that. What would that be? 1 over 121 if I had to. So what you get now is you got 1 25th plus, and now look at each of these pairs. Each of these pairs, again, this is an alternating series which converges. So these are decreasing in terms of their positive components. And therefore, we get a negative 1 over 36 plus 1 over 49 is going to be a negative number plus another negative number, plus another negative number, and so on and so forth. So R4 is 1 25th plus some negative numbers. So therefore, R4 has to be smaller than 1 25th. Now, hopefully that all makes sense. Now, again, if you remember what we were, going, what we were trying to do, we were trying to figure out a good approximation for this series. And so what I'm saying is that as an approximation for this series, S4 has to be within 1 25th of this series. Let me write that in terms uh, outright. So S4 which we said is 115 over 144. Let me make sure I've got the fraction right. 1 15th over 144 is within, oh, let's do this, 1 25th of whatever my series converges to. Okay, so S4 is within 1 25th of whatever my series converges to, of this sum. Some people call this sum S. I like to just write the actual series out. But there you go. S4 is within 1 25th of the actual series because we know S4 plus the remainder is in fact this series and the remainder is at most 1 25th and the smallest zero hopefully that all makes sense so what i'd like you to do is i'd like you to take this series we've already written out 
um, the first 10 terms. And I'd like you to try to say, well, what, how many terms S sub what would approximate within 1 50th of the actual sum of whatever this series is. Push pause on the video and do that approximation. All right, so hopefully you went ahead and did that. Now, what you'll see is that you want to approximate to within 1 50th. So you look at the sum. Now, 1 50th is not one of our fractions, but if you talk about where it's in between in terms of absolute values, it's in between 1 49th and 1 64th, again, in terms of absolute values. So what you're going to do is you're going to take the 1 49th and before, that's S7, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The partial sum was seven terms. Now that actually on my calculator didn't even uh, convert into a fraction. Um, it just had, uh, just gave me the decimal point, which was about 0.831246. It's a really ugly fraction if you do it. So S7, this uh, decimal, must be within, well, 1 64th, therefore it must be within 1 50th. By the way, if you look at this remainder, let me highlight that remainder here. If you look at that remainder, notice it starts out with a negative number. So we know the remainder is actually going to be negative, so it's going to be below zero. But it's going to be a negative 1 64th, and then if you pair these up, these next two, that pair is going to be positive, and then the next pair is going to be positive, and the next pair is going to be positive. So R7 is between um, negative 1 64th and 0. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense. The remainder after 7 terms. So S7, because R7 is within 1 64th of the actual sum, it must be within 1 50th of the actual sum because 1 64th is a lower number in terms of absolute values than 1 50th. So S7, which I said is approximately 0 0.831241496, must be within 1 50th of the actual summation. All right? And that's the, the basic idea of alternating series. Now, notice you can't get that if this series doesn't alternate. You can't do that trick of pairing things up. If you don't have the pairing things up, if you don't have the alternating, then um, you can't do that approximation. So it's a really nice thing to have alternating series. So here's what I'd like you to do. Oops, did I miss one? Nope. All right. I would like you to approximate the sum of this converging alternating series to within one five thousandth of the actual summation that we're looking for. By the way, I maybe I should have mentioned this earlier, but um, in order for things to actual, actually have approximations, these series do have to converge. Um, if the series doesn't converge, then it obviously is not going to have any good approximation. So, the alternating series has to converge to have an approximation. And this one does converge. And so I want you to find an approximation within 1 5,000th 
of the actual sum. Go ahead and push pause on the video and then come back and see how to do it. Here we go. So the idea here, oops, thought I was up as far. No, not, not as up far. The idea here, we take negative 1 to the n over n factorial. Now, that starts out with negatives, then plus, then net minus. All right, so you're starting out, you're alternating in the numerator. Denominator, you're going n factorial. If you do 1 factorial, you get 1. 2 factorial, you get 2. 3 factorial, you get 6. 4 factorial, you get 24. Times 5, you get 120. Times 6, you get 720. All of a sudden, after about 4 factorial, this just starts growing enormously. And notice after 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 terms, the seventh term is a minus 1 over 5,040. That's within the 1 5,000th mark. So what I can do is I can stop right there. And I can say, well, I needed 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 terms. So S6. I needed 6 terms in order to get myself within 1 5,000th. Because again, 1 over 5,040 is less than 1 5,000th, again, dealing in terms of absolute value. By the way, the sum of those first six terms is negative 91 over 144. Again, I just had my calculator do that. And the remainder after six terms, uh, this one starts out with a negative. So it's actually less than zero, but more than negative 1 over 5,040. So S6, which as we said was negative 91 over 144, or you can get a decimal place for that, is within 1 5,000th of the actual sum I was looking for. By the way, notice that if you were to go out and you wanted to do, talking about like the 100,000s, you just need to go out two more spots. That's how fast that n factorial grows, right? So we get really, really close to the real sum in just a few iterations of these partial sums, OK? That's what that alternating is say, series is saying, is that in these few terms, we got really, really close to what the actual sum was. All right, I want you to try one more on your own. Go ahead and push pause on the video and approximate the sum of this converging alternating series to within one one thousandth. All right, so let's take a look at that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this one goes really fast. You plug in 1, and you get 1 seventh. You plug in 2. Now, 2 to the fifth is a pretty big number. It's 32. So times 7, you get 224 as your denominator. And you plug in 2, and you get a negative 1 as your numerator. You plug in 3, you're going to get a positive 1 as your numerator. 7 times 3 to the fifth is 1,701. By the way, you could keep doing this for a few more terms if you'd like, but if you want, you can say, well, 1 over 1701 is a smaller fraction than 1 over 1,000, and so I can stop there. And what I can do is I can say, well, let's split this up. This remainder piece, after I've summed up the first two terms, is going to be less than 1 out of 1,000. Uh, by the way, the sum of the first two terms, the partial sum, S2, is 31 over 224. 
the remainder piece again is positive. This is a positive 1 over 1701. So it's between 0 and 1 over 1701. So definitely the remainder is less than 1 1,000th. And so the first two partial sums, uh, the, I said sums, the S2, the partial sum of the first two terms, is within 1 1,000th of the actual sum. Now, by the way, just as a note, this fraction 31 over 224, S2, as a fraction, that was about 0.1383928571. Okay. Whoops. So what are we saying there? Well, what's one and one thousandth? That's the third decimal here. So basically what we're saying is that the entire sum has to be within, well, at least within two decimal places, but within this decimal place of the sum of this series. So we have a really good approximate. Again, it's rounded correctly if we've rounded it to two decimal places. It could be off by at most a thousandth. So we have a really good approximation with just the first two sums. Uh, two, the sum of the first two terms, excuse me. Again, this only works with alternating series. I have to hammer that down. This only works with alternating series. If your series has all positive terms, then it doesn't work this way. So make sure you don't try to apply this same reasoning when your series has all positive terms. It has to have this alternating back and forth between negative and positives, and obviously it has to converge. Um, We did this series earlier. This series, you it would never be within one one thousandth because it does not converge. All right. Now the way the book writes this is a little bit confusing to me, and so that's why I've been doing it by writing out always the first few terms and not dealing with uh, with how the book writes it. The book writes it the following way. If a convergent alternating series satisfies this, then the absolute value of the remainder, Rn, involving approximating the sum S by Sn, is less than or equal to the first neglected term. So basically, set this says, if the underlying sequence is decreasing on an alternating series and converging, then the remainder in terms of absolute value is less than or equal to that first term that we've left off. And the remainder is the difference between the actual series and the sum of the first n terms. All right. Again, that's what we've been doing. Um, in fact, I've even been dealing with the um, Sn and Rn notation, and then they're using S for the actual series. So that's how the book writes it. I prefer, you know, writing out the series and saying, oh yeah, the next term in the series is smaller in absolute value uh, excuse me, than the remainder here. Or the remainder in absolute value is smaller than the next term. I said that incorrectly. Now, one other component to section 9.5 is the difference between absolute 
and conditional convergence. Now, this is introduced here because it really doesn't, there's no difference between absolute and conditional convergence if all of our terms are positive. There's only a difference between absolute and conditional convergence when our terms alternate between positives and negatives. So let's talk about the three different ways a series can convert uh, can behave. Excuse me. So an infinite series, pretend this summation is from 1 to infinity or 0 to infinity, but it's an infinite summation. If we have a series, that series may diverge. If it diverges, we call it a divergent series. That series may converge. Now, it can converge in one of two different ways. And again, this is really only um, interesting when we're talking about alternating series. It can converge in what's called an absolute convergent way. That means the series converges, and also, if we take the absolute value of the terms, in other words, if all of our terms were positive, and we summed up the series with all of our terms being positive, that would also converge. So if the series converges and when you sum up all the positive pieces, all the positive terms, it also converges, we call that being absolute convergent. The series, if the series converges, but when you sum up the absolute value of all these terms, in other words, if you make all your terms be positive, so if making all of our terms be positive causes my series to diverge, then that type of convergence is conditional convergence. In other words, it only converged on the condition that this was alternating. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's do some examples. We're going to do examples that we've actually already seen before. So summation from n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1 over n squared. Now, we've already dealt with this once. So let's go back to it. Sorry, we knew, um, I misspoke there. I said we already saw that this converged. Um, we already dealt with this. I said it converged, um, but we didn't actually show that by the alternating series test. So if you look at this series, uh, let's show by the alternating series test that this converges. Take the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n squared. This 1 over n squared is the piece you get when you factor out the negative 1 to the n plus 1. And as the denominator grows to infinity, you get 0. So by the alternating series test, this series converges. It converges to something. I don't know exactly what it converges to, but it converges by the alternating series test. Positive pieces go to zero. Now, this convergence, we don't know necessarily whether it's absolute or conditional yet. So what we're going to have to do is, so since we know the series converges, now we're going to decide whether this convergence is absolute or conditional. So what we do is we check out what you get when you take the absolute value of the terms of inside this series. So what I mean by that is take this, take these terms, and take the absolute value of them. Now, if you do that, I'm not sure if you can see this easily or not, but the n squared part is always going to be positive, because we're starting at n equals 1 to infinity. We're put it, plugging in positive 
integers, that's always going to be positive. So absolute value of the denominator is just going to be n squared. Absolute value of the numerator, well, the numerator is just going to bounce between negative 1 and positive 1. So the absolute value is just 1. So we have an infinite sum from 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared. We're trying to figure out if that converges or not. Obviously, we can't use the alternating series because this is not an alternating series. All of these terms are positive. But it is 1 over n to a power. So what we can use is the p series test. We know that uh, in this case, p is 2. And so because p is greater than 1, this converges as well. So this thing, when I put absolute values around the term, it also converged. So one way to think of this is that this converged with alternating terms, but it also converged when our terms did not alternate, when I took the positive portion of all those terms and still added them up. So because it converges normally, and because it converges when I take the absolute values of the terms, we say, that this series converges absolutely. So this series converges absolutely. Or this is absolute convergence. There's a couple of different ways to say it. So. This series exhibits absolute convergence, or this series converges absolutely. But you get that it's absolute convergence because the original series converged, but also so did the absolute value, actually, the series when I take absolute values of the terms. So I want you to do a couple more of those. Whoops. I want you to do example 8 on your own. Now, we've already seen example 8 before with just convergence using the absolute, excuse me, the alternating series convergence. So if you look back in your notes, you'll see that. So I want you to figure out now if it either converges absolutely or if it converges conditionally. Push pause on the video and go ahead and do that. All right, earlier in this section, we did this first part. Um, again, go look back in the notes. We saw that the infinite sum of alternating negative 1 n plus 1 over natural log of n converges because if you look at factor out the negative 1 to the n plus 1, you're left with 1 over natural log that goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And so by the alternating series test, the series converges. So this series has to converge by the alternating series test. So we have to determine whether that convergence is absolute or whether that convergence is conditional. So we're going to take a sum of the absolute value of these terms Absolute value of natural log is just going to be natural log. Absolute value of negative 1 to a power is just going to be 1. So we're looking at a sum from n equals 2 to infinity, so an infinite sum of 1 over natural log of n. Now we know by a direct comparison to, I guess, the best direct comparison of this, whoops, I'm trying to look at for my sums. There we go. It's something like the sum of 1 over n. In other words, we know sum of 1 over n uh, 
diverges. And 1 over n goes to 0 faster than 1 over natural log of n. Again, these terms are smaller than those terms. So because this one diverges, sum of 1 over natural log of n also diverges. Now, what are we saying? We're saying that the actual series that I was given converges. But if I were to have used all of the terms as positive numbers instead of alternating, then that series would have diverged. So what we say is that this infinite series, let me just go. converges, but conditionally. In other words, in order for that series to converge, it was very much uh, based on the condition that this was alternating if my terms did not alternate, then it would have diverged. All right? So that's kind of what conditional convergence and absolute convergence are all about. Now, by the way, obviously, we can have other scenarios too. I want you to push pause and figure out what this series does. If it's divergent, absolutely convergent, or conditionally convergent. All right, hopefully you push pause on that. Check that out. Um, so in this case, infinite sum from 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1 over 5. This is alternating. That negative 1 to the n plus 1 will cause it to be alternating. However, if you factor that negative 1 to the n plus 1 out, what you get is just 1 fifth. Notice that fifth, that 5 there in the denominator is not raised to any power. So limit as n goes to infinity of 1 fifth is just 1 fifth. This is obviously not equal to 0. And so by the alternating test, this series has to diverge. So this series diverges. And by the way, once we know the series diverges, we know that the series diverges, right? There's no conditional divergence or absolute con divergence. Um, we can just stop there. So once I know that a series diverges, that's all it can do. There's no conditional, absolute, anything like that. So there you go. That diverges. All right, last one I want you to do is to look at example 10. Um, we've dealt with this um, earlier, but I want you to now determine whether the convergence that we saw earlier is absolute or conditional convergence. Go ahead and push pause on the video and do that. All right, so this infinite sum here we knew already going into this that converges because um, we saw earlier that the limit of 1 over n factorial was 0. So by the alternating series test, this thing, this series here, must have converged. Okay, so we know the series converges based on the alternating series test. Now we take a look at what happens when we take the absolute value of all the terms and then add them all up. So we take the sum of n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1 over n factorial. n factorial is always going to be positive, so absolute value of that is not going to affect n factorial. Absolute value of negative 1 to the n plus 1 is just going to be 1. And we actually saw in the last section that this thing converged. Whoops. Whoops. 
And the way we showed that in the last uh, section was that we did a direct comparison to 1 over 2 to the nth. We saw that 1 over n factorial goes to 0 faster than 1 over 2 to the nth, which we knew converged because of the geometric series. And therefore, sum of 1 over n factorial goes to 0 fast enough to converge. Now, what all of this means, since the original series converged and the series when we take absolute values of the terms also converges converge converge means that we have absolute convergence So absolute convergence, or it converges absolutely. Again, those two uh, words, I'm not going to be picky about the linguistic, but absolute convergence of that original series. Now, just a side note before I leave off. Just a side note is that if I take a... Uh, infinite series, which already has positive terms, then there's no such thing as conditional convergence. Uh, we know that this thing converges because of the P-series test, right? P-series test. Um, P is 8. So we're doing powers of 8, 1 over n to the 8th. If I said, well, what about what's going to happen when I put an absolute value around this infinite summation, or excuse me, all, each term, oops, I hit the wrong number. Well, if you put an absolute value bar around 1 over n to the 8th, let's go ahead and do that. it doesn't actually change anything. It still gives you 1 over n to the 8th, which we already know converges because of the P-series test. So all of the series that we dealt with in section 9.2, well, almost all the ones we dealt with in 9.2, but all of the ones that we dealt with in 9.3 and all of the ones that we dealt with in 9.4 when we said they converged, that was an absolute convergence. And when we said they diverged, they diverged. Okay? There's no way we can get converging series, which has positive terms, to somehow change when we make all those terms positive, because making all those terms positive is not going to change anything. So hopefully that makes sense. So really the the alternating, the conditional versus absolute only comes up when we are alternating. However, in 9.6, we're going to see a certain couple of rules that tell us about convergence, and it's going to deal with these terms, absolute, convergent, and then unknown, specifically the absolute convergent. So that's what we're going to see in 9.6. All right, so this is the end of 9.5. Uh, we'll see you in 9.6.